everybody. My name is Jacek Bartosiak. Welcome to Strategy and Future. Today, we are having a prominent guest, Timo Fanel, uh, a retired captain, the U.S. Navy captain. Uh, he's, uh, the last post was a chief uh, intelligence officer for the uh, United States Na Pacific Fleet. Fleet. Is it correct, Kimo? Yeah, that's right. And we will be talking, of course, about the uh, the future and the present, uh, and at the present, and of course the uh, potential contingency in the Western Pacific. And let me start out immediately by the following question. And my question will both uh, try to address the political realm, realm, and the military realm. What would happen, in your opinion? if the Chinese imposed the selective quarantine on Taiwan, denying access by sea, by air, and otherwise, in all contemporary domains, to this island, but the de deliberately announcing it's a selective locate, selective quarantine, and all you know, vessels, Japanese, German, French, Australian, and whoever, except for the United States, can sail and fly, and even sometimes the United States, but it will be, you know, adjusted case by case by the, you know, the, uh, the Chinese uh, decision makers. First, what would happen politically? What do you think? What will be the, uh, the, the outcome of it, the result? What would be the escalation? What would be the thinking in D.C., uh, given, you know, all that you've been saying for years? Because people... People listening to us should know that you've been an, a, a staunch advocate of addressing the challenge that is uh, that was, you know, emerging in the Western Pacific. So let's talk politically first. What would happen after that? Well, Jacek, first of all, thanks for inviting me onto your show. Uh, second, uh, I've been pretty clear about saying that uh, if it got to the point where uh, the Chinese Communist Party and the current leader Xi decided that they were going to take action to forcibly uh, unify Taiwan into the People's Republic of China, that they wouldn't go half measures. So I will just say up front, I don't think the idea of a selective quarantine is likely. I think once they decide to go, they will go full force uh, to ba basically to counter what's happened to Putin in the Ukraine. They don't want to go through something like that. And they've talked in the past about short, sharp wars. So I think that's their modus operandi if they decide to go. But to your question, I think uh, if there was a quarantine that said the United States uh, couldn't enter ships in and around the Taiwan Strait or to be to resupply, if you will, uh, Taiwan, I think that would be uh, almost taken like it was, I think, in 2014 when the Chinese declared their East China Sea Air Defense Identification Zone. It was the it was a declared statement, uh, and everybody kind of acknowledged it, and then kind of smirked or laughed about it in a, in a sense because it it had no impact. And I think in the same way, if there was some kind of selective quarantine that just said United States can't come in, everyone else can. I don't think that would actually impact the people of Taiwan's ability to. Uh, to get food, to get fuel, and to be able to conduct commerce with, with the world because the United States isn't really uh, one of the major uh, shipping uh, and merchant fleets of the world. So I think the thing that would cause the most concern would be where would China, where would this quarantine affect the, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. 7th Fleet, and their ability to operate in the region. If for some reason China were to finally try to cut off the United States from access to the uh, Taiwan Strait, that would get some attention in Washington and, and, and contingency plans would be, you know, enacted. Yeah, well, but, but let me explain why I'm, I'm you know, b b trying to, 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 to sell the case for quarantine. Because in the gr grand scheme of things, I don't see a rationale for the Chinese to initiate a very risky amphibious operation to seize the island that is offshore. Instead, it can achieve all geopolitical, uh, you know, outcomes uh, that they would like, to, they, they would desire by undermining the U.S. position in the Western Pacific by showing who is in charge of those waters. And 
for selective quarantine could be good enough, Timo, I think. Because, you know, it would be upon the United States to form up a coalition that might trigger the Third World War. So they w- might be reluctant. So such a move politically by the Chinese Communist Party could drive the wedge and split up the interests of Jap- the Japanese, South Koreans, U.S., Germans, and stuff, because people always want to preserve peace and globalized system of trade. And it would be upon the United States to, to change it, to, you know, to, to, to break away with it, sort of. And uh, the Chinese will always have a, a maneuver space to negotiate the, the, the transit. And people will seek so those negotiations. So I think politically, the United States will be in a very difficult situation with each passing day when the population of Taiwan will be you know, suffering by that, will be threatened by that. And that's a show of force. Don't you agree with that? No, I, I hear, I understand the logic of your argument, but I don't think it's persuasive. First, um, the United States isn't the only nation that has a vested interest in the the uh, independence, if you will, of, of Taiwan in terms of, uh, you know, having their ability to exist without it being coerced by Beijing. Japan has been very clear over the last two years that J- Japan's national security is linked to Taiwan's national security. So it's not just the United States that has uh, been kind of a what you would say a protector of Taiwan's uh, freedoms, uh, but Japan now has clearly uh, expressed that not just in in uh, by their politicians, which is highly highly unusual over the last sixty plus years to have Japanese politicians come out and say these things like they have over the last two or three years, but they've also started to begin to build up their defense and increase their defense spending, which is also highly unusual. And if you just look at this last week here with the G7 in Hiroshima, there was lots and lots of uh, commentary from uh, Chinese uh, press and and propagandists that were talking about, you know, being very concerned about Japan and where Japan stands. And so I think if you're trying to create this, the issue of how could you create a wedge to drive you know, and def- and deflate America's uh, assurance of security in the region, you're going to have to also address Japan because it's not just Taiwan. So I think, I, I think, you know, again, the issue is if the Chinese start to try to use military forces to manhandle or deny space in the maritime domain, the global commons of those seas to the U.S. Navy, but not other navies. That that would be something that would be not just on the United States to address, but we already address it, and we've been addressing it over the last four or five years since Trump's been, and there's been, an, I think, a marked increase in U.S. and allied naval forces operating in concert together, whether it's having Canadians go through the, uh, the Taiwan Strait or French um, or... Um, Australians operating with the U.S. in the South China Sea or the Japanese operating with the U.S. in the South China Sea. We're seeing more and more of this uh, coalition of nations operating together. Now, it's not, it's not something to be taken for granted. And, and, and Biden's uh, you know, decision not to go down to Australia to meet with the Quad certainly has uh, not been very helpful on that. But the over the trend over the last five years has been to show uh, a, a unified approach to China's belligerent military uh, moves and aggression. I think there could be a lot more that the alliances and partners could do, but I don't think a declaration of a uh, a, cor- a selective quarantine uh, is going to raise that much of a, an issue. It's going to take something along the lines of the Chinese physically trying to prohibit the U.S. 7th Fleet uh, from transiting through the Taiwan Strait or something similar to that. Okay, but you know, let me be a you know advocato diaboli. Okay, the the advocate, the devil's uh, advocate here. You know, still we had this uh, journey of Macron, president of France, to, to Beijing, uh, where he explicitly stated that Europe wants to be you know out of this Taiwan thing, sort of so to speak. So. Uh, Again, 
here in Europe, you know, we, we especially in Poland, where we, you know, as you know, very much uh, into maintaining the uh, the global stability under, you know, the how, how it has worked for the last 30 years. And we would like to see the rules of the road being sort of, you know, operating in the way they, they have. Still, we see rifts of perceptions, just like in the 30s prior to the Second World War, when the League of Nations were crumbling over the, you know, sanctions against the Italian aggression uh, on Ethiopia and elsewhere. And uh, we see those also in the case of Ukraine, we, there was no solidarity of interest here, especially at the beginning. And, uh, you know, we, we fear that this might uh, happen again in case of Taiwan and quarantine uh, might be a, a good tool to, to still create the impression that the war is not imminent, it can, you know, peace can be saved. You know what I mean? So I understand that the Japanese uh, are, are with the United States, the Japanese Navy, uh, you know, but for, for example, I would personally, as a strategist, I would very much feel more confident and secure if the United States sort of, you know, announced the plan, how it wants to address such thing, if the any quarantine is uh, is implemented. So, so there is no misperception on both sides of the strait, how it's going to work. And still, I haven't seen such a, such a thing. So to end uh, this political part of our conversation, uh, what do you think about that? And then I will move to military questions regarding this, uh, this scenario. Sure, I, I agree with you. I think uh, more strategic clarity is needed uh, by the United States. A, almost a year and a half ago, I wrote uh, an op-ed for the Washington Times that called for the ending of this uh, unwritten policy of strategic ambiguity and for the United States to come out and just clearly state uh, that we will not accept uh, you know, any PRC military or otherwise coercion uh, to the people of Taiwan or their their freedoms, uh, we do that for other things. We have a mutual defense treaty with uh, Japan, and we've clearly stated that if if China takes the Senkaku Islands, that there will be consequences for that. We won't stand by for that. We've said that uh, for the Philippines. Uh, we should have said it in 2012 for the Philippines, but we failed, uh, and that allowed them to get Scarborough Shoal. But we, in general, over the last 60 plus years. We've had a policy where we've been very clear about our commitments to our treaty allies. Uh, we don't have a mutual defense treaty with Taiwan. Uh, I think it's we have the Taiwan Relations Act. We have a lot of other things because it's not a declared state anymore. Uh, but I think it's very clear. I mean, even this president has four times said that if China were to try to uh, invade uh, Taiwan, that the United States would come to its defense. So we've had that. Uh, pretty clearly stated, but it's not really been backed up with uh, other kind of activities that I think would be necessary, such as I think it's time for you know ship visits and uh, airplane visits from the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command forces into Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, we probably should have done that 20 years ago uh, when the PLA was less uh, uh, robust than it is today, uh, but there's always this uh, these words in Washington from select groups, I call them the China hands, that always say, oh, if you do this, it'll start World War III. So there's no gray zone between appeasing China and thermonuclear war. If you read uh, Graham Allison's book, uh, The Thucydides Trap, it very much puts things in that term, terms, yeah. which is oh. either, either we appease China and don't cross their red lines, or it's, if you do anything, it'll cause... World War III and thermonuclear war. And that's just not historically accurate. In history, there's all kinds of shades of gray. And I think there's lots of maneuver room for the United States to be able to come out and speak about what it is that we can bring to bear uh, in, in, in defense of freedom and democracy uh, for all nations, not just Taiwan. Yeah, and, and in that vein, are, are you a bit... Uh disconcerted or unsettled that there is no protocol of, uh, you know, managing those uh, act situations, occurrences of situations that might escalate to war 
between the Chinese and the Americans, and the Chinese don't want to have this sort of, what you call it, you know, this sort of um, arrangement that there is a red line to call if an accident happens. Do you think that this works in favor of the United States brinkmanship or in favor of the Chinese still expanding and uh, distorting the rules of the, uh, of the international system? How do you think? Well, we had a, essentially since 1979, when we switched our recognition from Taipei to Beijing, the United States engaged basically 40 years of, of engagement with the PRC, the People's Republic of China, the Chinese Communist Party. And we, you know, ass assess them and help them get into the World Trade Organization, uh, the World Health Organization, all kinds of international organizations. The United States helped the PRC and, and, and tried to uh, cooperate with them. Uh, if you read each year, the U.S. Department of Defense puts out an annual report on the People's Republic of China and the People's Liberation Army. And if you go to the back of those annual reports, you'll see in appendices that list all the engagements that the Department of Defense has done with the PLA. And if you read those for the last 23 years, when the first report came out in 2000, you'll find that there's literally been tens of thousands of exchanges between the United States Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and Navy with their counterparts in China. And the same can be said for the Department of the Treasury, the Department of Commerce, the Department of Education, the FBI, all kinds of Justice Department, all elements of the U.S. government have been trying to do people-to-people -people exchanges and other kinds of coordination and cooperation. And we did that for 40 years, as I said. And over those 40 years, there was an assumption or a, a hope that the PRC would recognize the benefits of the international system that was established after World War II and peace and stability could be enjoyed by all nations and that China's could, economy could continue to grow as everyone else's and that things would normalize and we could get along, get along, go along with buying and trading and just getting richer and fatter and all of that. Well, that didn't happen. The PRC said, no, we don't want to be part of the Washington consensus. We have a Beijing consensus. Uh, and we're going to build, and we're going to build our strength and our power, and they have done that. And now they have one of the largest uh, militaries in the world. They certainly have the largest navy in the world today, and they have great capability. And they haven't become more moderate. They've become more belligerent, more uh, threatening to Taiwan and to India and to Japan and to the Philippines and to Vietnam. Uh, so everything that we assumed about engagement has turned out to be a false uh, regard. So then the Trump administration came in and they recognized that and they said, well, we're not going to chase after all these engagements. Now, they didn't close off all engagement. They just simply reduced the scale of it by a little bit, actually, not even that much. If you look at the DOD reports from when the Trump administration was in, the number of, of military to military engagements still remained very high, in my opinion, too high. Uh, so now what's happened is that China has now, since in the Biden administration, China's come in and said, we know how to manipulate you. We're not going to talk to you. And what do you see over the last 24 months plus? You see, especially with uh, Secretary of State Blinken, but not just with him. You saw the Indo-PACOM commander on PBS earlier this year, Admiral Aquilino. And others say, I really want to talk to my counterpart. I've been trying to talk to my counterpart, yep. but my counterpart won't talk to me. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. So China has China knows that they have got somebody, as we say in fishing, you got them on the hook. So they are they're playing us. And the best thing that we could do on the US side is to say, fine, I'm not talking to you. And and we'll leave it at that. There's mechanisms there. The hotlines, as you mentioned, are there. They have in the naval arena and in the air arena, we have these fuse code for un, unencountered, unexpected encounters at sea. So there's protocols in place, but it's not the mechanisms that are the issue. It's about the strategic national outlook. And Beijing is using what they call comprehensive national power, all elements of their, all levers of their national power to achieve their national strategic goal which is to become 
the world's great superpower on 1 October 2049. And part of that achieving that goal is to have the most dominant economy, the most uh, dominant military, and the most dominant diplomatic corps, and to control the world's soft power through information and, and, and culture. And they're, they're on an agenda to achieve those goals. And part of it is the restoration of what they believe is their territory, which is why Taiwan is so important. Yeah, Kima. You know, but just, you know, moving into the, you know, more granularly. So, because there is a lot of misperception across Europe as uh, as concerns the uh, the build up of the, the the Chinese navy its capabilities could you tell uh, our audience more about the build up of the Chinese navy but even of course less about the numbers although they still matter but what how this build up is betraying intentions and how you see this build up and how they perform uh, from the perspective of the you know operations uh, capabilities as a chief uh, intelligence officer uh, sees through those things, not Wikipedia, you know, numbers of ships and stuff, but tell us more of how you, you know, how professionals look at that, uh, uh, those thing, you know, things. Sure. Well, I think numbers matter uh, in ultimately because you have to go back and you have to ask, look at what was being reported and assessed by experts like me 20, 25 years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And no one ever predicted that the Chinese Navy would be the biggest num Navy in the world by number of platforms. So, in fact, when I was making assessments like that, that they were on this trajectory, many people ridiculed that and said, oh, that's never going to happen. And it's decades away. So now we're there. The Chinese Navy actually has more platforms than other, other navies. And so the question is, how did they get there with us not understanding that? And then when you add in like things, other metrics like tonnage, it's not just the number of ships that the United States is losing to China on. China is producing four or five ships for every one that the United States produces. China produces five, the United States produces one. That's for like the last 10 years. Also in tonnage. So we produced one aircraft carrier over the last decade, China produced three. They produced in the last three years, they produced seven large deck amphibious warships, three uh, uh, type 075s and the, the amphibious helicopter carriers, the LHAs, and uh, then the type 071s, uh, the smaller LPDs. So, you know, they produced a lot of major surface combatants. I didn't even mention the eight type 055. 12,000 ton cruisers or the numbers of corvettes, uh, the Zhangdiao class, and uh, all you could just go on and on with every category of, of surface combatant and submarine that the Chinese have produced. And then you start looking at the components inside those platforms. And they're now carrying all of, almost all of these major new surface uh, combatants are carrying uh, long range supersonic uh, anti ship cruise missiles like the YJ-18, 300 kilometer range, longer than anything that's in the U.S. Navy. So now the U.S. Navy is now playing catch up to trying to figure out how to get uh, anti-ship cruise missiles into the U.S. Pacific Fleet and, and Navy wide around the world, but specifically in the Pacific Fleet, because China, in their design system, going back now over 25 years, they, they talk about what they call counter-intervention. So they built and designed a military force that's designed to block away and keep the U.S. from being able to operate its platforms in defense of Taiwan. And our number one platform is the aircraft carrier. So that if the aircraft carrier can sail in, launch aircraft that can then go fly and target Chinese warships east of Taiwan or in the Taiwan Strait, then we want to get that carrier as close as possible so that those sorties that come off the carrier can spend more time searching for Chinese warships and sinking them. Well, what did the Chinese do? Instead of building that Navy first, or the carrier Navy, they built submarines and they built anti-ship cruise missiles and, and ballistic missiles. And they built the DF-21D and the DF-26 that are anti-carrier ballistic missiles specifically designed 
to sink our aircraft carriers. And one went about 900 miles, another one went about 1,800 miles, or 900 kilometers, 1,800 kilometers. Basically, one can cover the first island chain, the DF-21D, and then the DF-26 can go out to Guam. So they successively focused in on preventing the United States aircraft carriers from getting in close. Now we're starting to read and hear more about the Chinese now starting to change their submarine force from the numbers of, you know, 55 plus diesel and air independent propulsion submarines that they built to operate in the shallow waters of the East China Sea and around Taiwan in the Taiwan Strait, which is what they built since 2000. Now they're starting to ramp up their production facilities in the Bohai at Huladao to produce nuclear submarines, fast attack and ballistic missile submarines, which will be able to go more uh, farther beyond the second island chain and to even impact U.S. force arrival from Hawaii or from the West Coast. So I think you're seeing a force that's been built, the PLA, all focused on preventing the U.S. from being able to come and bring its military uh, forces to bear to be able to defend Taiwan. That's been their strategy, and they've been progressively towards progressing towards that. But there are other indicators that it's say they believe that once they acquire Taiwan, they're not just going to stop at Taiwan. Why else would you start building these uh, uh, type uh, 903 uh, fast uh, comprehensive resupply ships? which they are starting to build those in serial production now, which is the same size as a U.S. Uh, Henry J. Kaiser class resupply uh, vessel, you know, about 25,000 tons. And they're designed to go around the world and supply uh, their, their fleets with food and fuel and armament, arms. And so that's, the, that's kind of the I, where I see the Chinese are. They've got immediate goal that they've been working on for 25 years or 30 years to be able to take Taiwan and keep America and Japan away. Once they achieve that, then they have been built. They continue to build uh, platforms that show that they want to have a global reach with their navy. Sure, sure. That's why they are building the the fourth fleet in the Indian Ocean and uh, with an eye on the Indian Ocean and the communication lines to the Middle East, Europe, and Africa. Uh, especially given the fact that the Indian Ocean is uh, the most distant from the for the U.S. Navy, maybe that's why the U.S. Navy wanted to to make this deal with Australia and station uh, U.S. nuclear submarines in Port Stirling, uh, west coast Australia, to to inter interdict uh, the the maritime lines of communication of the Chinese Navy in the northern Indian Indian Ocean, and uh, but still they 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 sort of. Uh, want to em emulate the, um, the American way of projecting power later, maybe after the showdown with the U.S., by uh, procuring U.S. aircraft carriers and uh, the aircraft groups, aircraft carrier groups. Uh, so where are they uh, in, in that particular field, given the fact that it takes decades to learn how to operate and fly and have aviation pro proper and so on and so forth? Yeah, when it comes to their aircraft carriers, um, you're right. It took the United States 100 years to get to where we are with our aircraft carriers. Uh, we have 11 of them. Uh, I spent the first 20 years of my career when I went to sea, sea duty, on the aircraft carriers. And so it's something that we um, learned through trial and error. A lot of people died uh, for the lessons that we learned. And uh, what I can tell you is, the Chinese aren't don't have to use all that all those decades themselves to relearn exactly the same lessons through the school of hard knocks. They're going to be able. They have learned those lessons through espionage, uh, you know, covert intelligence collection, and just overt uh, data mining from the internet. And then we've had people that have provided them uh, information. Um, if you think about it. It was in 20, fall of 2012 when the first J-15s did uh, landings on board the Liaoning, their first carrier. And here we are 12 years later, and they have a third aircraft carrier, the Fujian, who's just done mooring and, and engine power testing here this last couple of weeks and is getting ready to be, you know, uh, commissioned and put in the, you know, it's in the water, but commissioned and start to operate an air wing 
using electro electromagnetic aircraft launch system. So they went from a, a carrier that they got from the Ukraine that they refurbished. So now they have a, a, a you know, a, a diesel propelled uh, a craft, a vessel, the, the, the Fujian, but it's got these propulsion systems, which are essentially the same as USS Gerald Ford, which is our latest carrier. And we've been struggling for five years to get that carrier out to sea and operationally relevant using the EMALS system. And China's already got it. So they they essentially took 100 years of technology and compressed it into 10 years. And that's what they've done with a lot of technology in the military arena. But in the carrier arena, they've done that. And uh, so they, they're they going to lose people. They're going to have some problems. But they're, they've... They've gone to school on what the American Navy has done, and they're advancing rapidly. The question is, you know, how, I think the question is, some people ask me, why would they invest in carriers when they know that American carriers are so vulnerable to things like the DF-21B? Yeah, and, exactly. That's a good question. Yeah, and that, and I, my answer to that is kind of what we said in the last one, which is, they're focused on basically, as you, I think you use the word showdown with the United States over Taiwan. And it almost gets back to your first question about what could break the United States credibility around the world. And maybe it's not a blockade, but I guarantee you if the, if the PRC is able to take Taiwan and to keep the United States military at bay and to prevent them from defending the people of Taiwan, I don't care how much military force the United States has remaining. We will become uh, a very weakened. Yes, uh, that's for sure. The, the global system will collapse. Yes. That's well, sure. I, I don't know if it'll collapse immediately, but there will be great uh, reluctance now to trust the United States because we will have been uh, resisted by somebody. You know, we we left Afghanistan, but that was 30 years. We left Vietnam after many, many years. So we've suffered defeats, if you will. But in a, a showdown like this, where the, the PLA would be able to actually physically prevent us from achieving a goal, uh, would be something that I don't think the United States uh, could could survive. And I don't. And maybe you're right. The whole system won't survive. But when China does that. They want to fill that vacuum, and they're going to fill it with carriers. And so that's why they've been so aggressive on that, because they recognize carriers aren't just for fighting wars. They are. That's their primary mission. But they've seen what the United States has done since World War II with our aircraft carriers. And during the Cold War, U.S. aircraft carriers were a great uh, uh, symbol of American power. And as you know, the old saying, that presidents would always in event of a crisis somewhere, would say, where is the carriers? Where are the carriers? Even here in the last, uh, before the, you know, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, uh, under Trump administration, for the first time in history, we sent a carrier air wing off of one of our aircraft carriers, I think it was the Truman Carrier Strike Group, and it did a Balt -op, Balt Baltic operations with NATO up in the Baltic. The air wing. Now, the carrier didn't come in at that point. But the fact is, we use the air wing to show strength uh, and, and resolve of NATO and America against Putin. Uh, and it, it worked at that time, but we haven't really. We, that's the power of an aircraft carrier and its air wing, is to be able to go and operate and show and demonstrate resolve. And China recognizes that. Yeah. You know, but since we've been talking about the uh, the buildup of the uh, Chinese Navy, I understand that the, the the capacity of the Chinese merchant fleet and it, its shipyards, which uh, next to the South Koreans and the Japanese, are building the 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 o o overwhelming portion of the uh, of the ships, civil civilian ships, merchant ships in the world also corresponds to the capability, you know, to enhance production in case of crisis and so on, right? That's how it works with the Navy schema, right? Yes. And are you unsettled by the fact that the United States doesn't have major merchant fleet anymore and doesn't have this surge capabilities of increasing production 
of the uh, Navy vessels if there is a crisis looming quickly or something like just like it was during the Second World War and the uh, Vincent's uh, plan of expanding Navy in the 30s. Correct. Yeah, it, it's very concerning. Um, I think we just had our Secretary of the Navy, Del Toro, gave a speech a couple of months ago, and he mentioned that China has 13 major naval shipyards and the United States has seven. And just one of the Chinese shipyards, Zhanglongdao, is larger than all seven of the U.S. shipyards. Uh, so it's incredible. Um, since I think the Cold War, we had around 22 uh, uh, major naval shipyards and we're down to seven. So we've been in decline in terms of uh, ship production capacity and China's been increasing. And America, you know, when I joined the U.S. Navy, I joined the U.S. Navy because we were on the track to us to achieve 600 ships. I, we didn't quite get to 600, it was like 590 something. But the point was we were in the 80s, Kimo. In the 80s it was, right? Or in the 80s, mid 80s, and under Ronald Reagan. But we still the 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 if you were a naval officer at that time, it was just understood that America's history was based upon being a maritime power, and Unfortunately, after Desert Shield and Desert Storm in 1990, we essentially engaged in almost 35 years of land war. And what happened to the United States strategic defense cap capacity is we forgot about being a major naval power and we became obsessed with uh, the war on terror in the Middle East and fighting and looking for uh, terrorists, individual people, which was all, you know, I, I get it. I know why we did that. Uh, but we kind of forgot that we needed to do what we did in the Cold War, which was to maintain both a large ground force and a large naval force. So during the Cold War, we had maintained large standing armies in Europe to protect against the fold of gap and, and, and keep Europe safe and, st safe and stable. In, with respect to the Soviet Union, but we also maintained a global navy to challenge the Soviet Navy around the world. And after the uh, uh, Desert Storm, we we just started to erode. We had the the, the base realignment uh, uh, activities where we shut down our bases, realigned our bases, and we started to draw down. And we told ourselves falsely that there would be a peace dividend. And that we could take that defense spending and do other things with it inside the United States. And what did we really see is that we were deceiving ourselves. We weren't really students of history, and we didn't recognize uh, that there would always be adversaries and that we gave up our maritime birthright. And so now we're in a position where we can't produce the fleets that we need as fast as we need them because we don't have the industrial shipbuilding uh, capabilities. I've been banging that drum for quite a while. I'm now starting to see this year, especially with the new China Commission in the House of Representatives, there's people that are really seriously talking about this. Uh, but this is something, and, and you alluded to it, this takes time uh, to build industrial shipbuilding yards. So there's all kinds of options in addition to building shipyards that we need to pursue. For instance, we have ships that are in mothballs. What are we doing with those ships that are in mothballs? What is their status uh, in terms of their ability to get to sea and to be able to be integrated into a, a conflict with the Chinese? Are there systems that we could put on there, modular anti-ship cruise missile systems that we could bring out, new systems to put on older ships uh, that we could think about and look at? We, we generally have not done that very well. And then you have to start looking at manning, training, uh, readiness for those ships and all of that. Uh, there's another option which says, well, we have partners and allies that have shipyards in the Philippines, in in, in uh, Japan, in Korea. How are we working with them? Is there a way that we could par partner with them to ask them to increase production of their war fleets that would be built to our specifications that we could use? And then there's just plain old, are we going to have the the national will to go in and say we need to do something like Vincent did uh, pre World War II and have a two ocean navy act 
uh, in this case, uh, I would call it the One Nation, uh, One Navy Nation Act, which is we need to have a major, massive uh, growth of the U.S. Pacific Fleet uh, that can deal with the Chinese Navy because it's not going to stop, as I said. Sure. The last question before we end, uh, Kimo, although I would like to talk with you for hours about all those details, fascinating. You know, the, uh, when you started talking about the threat, it was still uh, sometimes uh, even outlandish for some, outlandish proposition. Yeah? Now it's a mainstream that their war might be imminent over Taiwan. First of all, how do you feel about it? And the second is, are we re really destined for war over Taiwan or over something else with China? I mean, the United States and the, the you know the, the allies alliance system. What is your gut feeling? You know, after so many years of your devotion to the subject that I have been seeing all all the times through, how do you feel, and what what do you think will happen? Well, I I guess what I'd say is. The reason I felt so passionate about this is because um, I knew that if we didn't address it, that the consequences would be devastating, not just for the people of Taiwan, which it will be. Uh, what we've seen in Hong Kong is just a, a, a very faint shadow of what will happen to the people of Taiwan. Uh, we should look to Tibet or Xinjiang for even, even more close uh, consequences of what, or not consequences, what, what it would look like if China takes Taiwan or tries to take Taiwan. It'll be devastating. And so I wanted to avoid that. And it'll have ramifications throughout the world, uh, and, and not least of which to my country, the United States of America. But it'll impact people in Europe, as I tell European audiences all the time. If you think that you can just sit by and watch a war between China and Taiwan not have an impact, well, then that's what the people of Asia could have said to you in Europe about the Russia and Ukraine, which we all know is not true. So it's, it, these have global impacts. And the only way, I believe, to, def, to deter those impacts is by signaling strength, as Reagan said, peace through strength. And so the only way to deal with hard men in Beijing and the Chinese Communist Party is to, is to sell, tell them if you want to go to war, I will go to war and I will kill you. Uh, and, and, and people don't like to talk like that. And as you said, 14, 20, you know, many years ago, when I started giving these warnings on China, people didn't want to hear that. First of all, they thought it was crazy. They said there's no way China could ever achieve what they've achieved. And then now that they're there, uh, people don't want to, People, the same people that denied that it would happen are now saying, well, there's no other option. It's we're it's inevitable. We just have to go along and allow China to do what they want to do, and that I don't agree with that either. So I think we're in an existential situation where we have to we have to say, do we believe in the principles that America's founders wrote about and enshrined in our Constitution and our Bill of Rights? Do we believe that it's the right of every person to say whatever they think without fear of retribution? Do we believe that people have the right to assemble together and to not have the government tell them that they can't meet together? Is it right to be able to go to the church that you want to go to church with or not to go to church? Is it right for you to be able to own a weapon to say, I want to defend my personal property and my personal life and my personal space? Do I have the right to not have the government come into my home and search it without a reasonable warrant? and all the things that are listed in our Bill of Rights. If we believe those, if we really believe those things are true, then we have to look at the People's Republic of China and recognize that they don't believe in that, and they want to take those liberties from us, which is why I very much admire the people of Poland, because of what you and your country have done here in the last two years or year and a half with the uh, with Putin in this, in this illegal invasion, this immoral invasion of, of Ukraine. You people have stood up again, people of Poland have stood up again and shown that you actually don't just speak to the values, but you follow them. And I'm very concerned in America right now that we're debating some of these things. And we have polls that show that young people are saying, I'd, I'll give up some of those rights if I can stay on Twitter or, or TikTok or some social media app. This is scary to me that people could think like this in the United States of America. And so, 
Uh, what do I think is going to happen? Well, I I think I think we're going to fight. It's going to be hard, uh, but if we do not fight, then we will become slaves, and that's no option. So there's only one option for me, which is to say we will stand up and and stand for our values and and defend those values even if it costs our lives. Okay, fair enough, Kimo. Thank you very much for this fascinating conversation. My guest today was uh, uh, Captain Retired Kimo Pano, uh, formerly Chief uh, Intelligence Officer of the Pacific Fleet. Thank you very much. Looking forward to hearing from you again soon. Thank you very much.